Hello, this video is regarding assessment of student writing, and specifically how to design a rubric using the six plus one traits of student writing. Uh, the six traits of writing are traits that historically, <clears throat> that being within the past 25 or 30 years, have been researched, and it's come to, and everyone has come to understand that um, most writing, when evaluated, is based upon these six things. Um, there's a PDF available on the website. Uh, it's the exact PDF that you're looking at here. But it lays all of these out for you. So let's walk through this PDF very briefly, and then I'll show you how these things work. We'll come back to this page. The first and most important is ideas. Of course, you can't get anything across if you don't have anything to get across. So the, always the top row will be about the ideas uh, that the student is trying to communicate. <clears throat> the ideas are usually tailored very specific to the assignment. We'll see what that looks like in a little bit. For instance, if you're writing a persuasive paper, all of your ideas are going to be organized in a persuasive, argumentative manner. Um, following ideas, we have organization. So, of course, the ideas have to be arranged in such a way that they become, if we're talking about a persuasive paper, persuasive. Um, then voice. How does the author say what they're trying to say? Is the voice appropriate for what the author is trying to say? Um, does it have a, uh, the proper effect on the reader? This is also an element of rhetoric. On each of these pages, you'll see um, the number one is equated with a low, very low descriptor, uh, with just beginning, halfway home, and ready to share. Building up through number five, it's me in that it sounds just like the voice of the person speaking. Um, even if even an academic speak. Um, if they're writing a, a professional or an academic essay, uh, does it sound authentic? Does it sound like that person would sound if they were speaking uh, in an academic setting? Um, be careful saying things like never use I and so on. Uh, sometimes there's an appropriate place for that if you're using an anecdote or something to illustrate a point. Um, the nice thing about this little elementary style handout that I've given you, it comes from a book on the six plus one trace of writing is that uh, there's nothing fancy about it. There, it, It's theory, I promise you that, but this is theory applied and you don't have to get fancy and get into all kinds of theoretical understandings here. Uh, it's very simply laid out and we'll go back to the first page here in just a moment and talk about that. Uh, here we have word choice. Along with voice is the author choosing appropriate words. Um, my favorite saying for this is uh, don't try too hard with language or uh, don't try to sound smart, just be smart. Then when you have sentence fluency, how are those words, the diction, uh, how are they arranged within the sentences? Um, the reason that word choice comes before sentences is because you've got to have the appropriate words relative to the voice, but then you start arranging things. So sentence fluency may not be long, drawn-out sentences. It can also be the occasional short sentence. Um, maybe it's a collection of short sentences, but the effect that it wants to create on the, the reader. Um, it's just that they are fluent relative to the purpose. Um, some of these descriptors here in my paper is easy to read out loud. That doesn't mean it's an easy read. That may simply mean that the, the paper isn't confusing, that the subjects and the verbs of the, the sentences are, are near one another such that the reader understands what they're reading and uh, doesn't get lost in pronouns and clauses and phrases. Here, some sentences are long and stretchy, some are short and snappy. I like the sound of this paper. It has rhythm. Often a variation between short and long sentences help to create that. And then finally, we have conventions. This is editing, uh, proofreading. Uh, this is last, mainly because um, it, it gets cleaned up when you clean up syntax. It gets cleaned up when you clean up word choice. It, get cl it's, it gets cleaned up when you clean up voice. Uh, as you start looking at the way pronouns are put together um, with the, uh, within the sentences, as you get to looking at the way the subjects and the verbs are placed within the sentences, as you start looking at uh, essential and non-essential clauses and phrases within sentences, you start cleaning up commas and so on. Um, I often say that uh, the conventions, having them all right won't help you a ton, but having ones that are messed up, um, improper pronoun agreement, improper subject-verb agreement, uh, bad comma placement, splices, etc., will certainly bring you down. Um, I like to, to use uh, this little analogy that um, if, you, if you have a piece of crap uh, for an idea, but all the sentences and commas and um, semicolons or whatever are all in the right spot and all the words are spelled correctly and it's all polished and nice, 
you still have a piece of crap. You can't polish a turd, is what I tell people. Uh, and as disgusting as that sounds, um, that works. It sticks in people's heads. Presentation is the plus one. We won't spend a whole lot of time on this. Sometimes this matters when it comes to writing articles uh, with bulleted lists and things of that sort. So uh, you're welcome to use that if you're doing something relative to, uh, to that. I'm going to go back to this second page, however, because this talks about the one through five, and this is how our rubric is going to be set up. See the one, two, three, four, five, and it's pretty, pretty clear. Wow would be the above and beyond, uh, the A plus plus, or maybe even the A plus. So the rubric I'm going to show you is going to work within these two uh, at the five, and then you have effective, developing, emerging, and not yet. Well, that's the document that I'll come down here and show you, um, if I can get it to switch over here. All right. So this is a typical looking table rubric with our six traits down the side. And you can see that I have put that language in here. Strong, effective, developing, emerging, not yet. One of the ways that I teach people to do this is to think of these words within these boxes. Often, always, sometimes, rarely, or never. Now these things will change, but this really helps get into people's minds what these different columns mean. Uh, so here you can see with organization, I have often used as transitional elements, often used as bridge words between uh, sentences. Then I've copied and pasted that and just changed to always. It's kind of neat. It's almost too neat how this changes. So as you get into more specific things that you're teaching, you'll say, okay, you're able to do this very specific thing here and then this very specific thing at the five. When I'm writing these, as you can tell, I always start at the five. I'm sorry, at the four. The often. I don't always use often, but I always start at this level or this level. Because then I know what my expectation is. My minimum expectation to say that the student is effective, that they're earning the A, that they have earned the right to say that yes, they've got what they need to get and they understand it, they've shown me that they understand it is this, and then I can grow from there, and I can bring it down from there. I want to note here that I say, I, I don't just say fail, but I say redo, and I say zero to sixty. Uh, the only way really in my class to get a zero is just not to do the work. The sixty is the fail. But something I want to point out here, if it will allow me, is within idea development, that's where you're going to see the greatest change relative to your assignment. So let's say you're doing a persuasive essay. So you're going to say in idea development, often the student uses emotional, logical, and ethical appeal often the appeals are supported by textual evidence from research so when this drops down and I copy and paste it Maybe I say, instead of often the student uses emotional, logical, and ethical appeal, and we should make this appeals, I would say uses two of the three emotional, logical, and or ethical appeals. Maybe I take out the sometimes. Maybe I just say the student uses two of the three or I could keep the often, maybe qualify it with often throughout the piece, the student uses two of the three emotional, logical, and or ethical appeals. And then I want to revise over here, often throughout the piece.
student uses emotional, logical, and ethical appeals. And then I'm going to take this because they can't always use all of them. That doesn't make sense to me. But often throughout the piece, the student um, uses the, uses the appeals very effectively. And maybe here, it's only somewhat effectively. So now the difference between the A and the B is that here they're using all three. Here they're only using two of the three. Up here, they're using all three, but they're using them more effectively. And maybe they're even very effectively and or while integrating them together. What I mean by that is that an emotional appeal is also seen as an ethical appeal, um, which does make good argument. So I've done that, and something I want to make certain that I do, just so it's easy to read, is I want all my bullets to be on the same level. And you can see I've done that here as well. Um, so I would want to take this one, paste it up here, which means I need to move these down. so that they're all on the same level and, again, easier to read. So often the appeals are supported by textual evidence from research. Often, here I would say, always supports the appeals with textual evidence from research. All right, and then I would continue to build down relative to. So I do want to show you, uh, I have a, a couple resources for you on this. Um, there are several sample units on the website, and this is one of them. Um, the, rubric, the units always have the rubric attached. And here you can see how this person has done theirs. It looks pretty good. They've gone the opposite direction, but still they have the strong, developing, emerging, and weak. They don't have a five. They don't have grades attached to it. That's okay. I would assume that they're going to be using this to, to score the student. Um, these units also have calendars on here, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, this one is relative to a persuasive letter. There's some formatting issues here, but still, I can see that the, that the student knew what they needed to do. Um, the final thing I wanted to show you is a website that has been very useful to many people um, called RubyStar. And um, again, the computer is lagging here um, because I'm recording. Um, but RubyStar, here's the website. It's rubystar.4teachers. That's a number four, teachers.org. This is free, and it will allow you to look at other people's rubrics. You can click writing. You can click reading if you're doing something with that. Of course, this class will focus on writing. And you can save them under your name. Um, you can see other things people have created relative to different assignments. So I encourage you to please go check this out. Uh, you might also just Google um, rubrics for writing, and you'll find all kinds of teacher websites that have different rubrics people have used. Um, I will be posting this on the website, but I encourage you to look at different ways of arranging these things. Uh, and I'm not going to be posting all with all this information within it. Uh, I will be posting just the blank template. Um, hope you're doing well. Please contact me if you need anything. Have a good day.